Hi folks and welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Zivna Kajimam again. And once again, we've got a great interview lined up for you today. With us on the line is Dr. Greg Story, who's probably a very familiar name for listeners who are involved in any kind of sales or leadership roles here in Japan. Greg is an old Japan hand, been here for over 30 years, moved to Japan from Brisbane, Australia. He is the uh, president of the Dale Carnegie Training Institute in Japan, one of the world's leading salesmanship, corporate training, public speaking, and interpersonal skill systems, in case you're not familiar with it. And he's represented and done some quite impressive leadership work for various large organizations, such as uh, Japan Desk Head for Jones Long LaSalle in Brisbane, in commercial real estate, the Austrade Country Head, promoting Australian products in Japan and providing market entry consulting services for companies. He was president of the National Australia Bank uh, Japan and the co-head of Shinsei Retail Bank here. He's also been president of the Australia and New Zealand Chamber of Commerce, instructor for business startups for the Tokyo Metropolitan Government and for the Japan Market Expansion Competition, the JMEC, and many, many more roles. As you can imagine, he's quite a whiz in all things related to communication, people skills, and yes, of course, sales. In fact, his book, Japan Sales Mastery is ranked the number one bestseller on Amazon in the sales and selling category in Japan, and for good reason. It is considered the Bible for corporations seeking market entry into what can often be a difficult market to understand and penetrate. And he's also a sixth dan in traditional Shitoryu Karate. He's been training for the last 46 years or so. Greg, thanks for being with us today. Pleasure having you on the show. Well, it's a great pleasure. I'm really looking forward to having a chat. So I guess the first thing I'd like to focus on is maybe your sales philosophy. Um, I've read and heard you say on more than one occasion that sales in Japan aren't really that different from anywhere else in the world. A statement which is probably a little bit counterintuitive to what many of us know or hear or about selling to the Japanese. It's often mentioned that etiquette, procedures, time frames, relationship forming are all vastly different here mm. to how they're handled in many different parts of the world, particularly in the West. And uh, to be honest, I've often found this to be the case personally as well. So could you maybe unpack that statement for us? Explain what you mean by the fact that they're not that different? I think that they are the same. And by that, I mean, there's a certain cycle in selling and it's very logical you need to understand what the buyer needs having the means to understand that requires you have well designed questions to uncover the need having found out the need you then do a little mental calibration can we actually do that and if you can then you go into explaining your solution and you go through a structure on that, talking about the uh, details, the spec, up through benefit, application of the benefit, evidence where it's worked before, and then a trial close. And then you flush out any uh, hesitation or objections they may have to what you're offering. You deal with the objections, the hesitation. You ask for the business. Now, that sales cycle is the same anywhere in the world if you're in professional sales. Where we run into trouble in Japan is unlike the West where we say, well, the buyer is king. As you and I know, living here, the buyer is not king in Japan. The buyer is God in Japan. And God not brook questions from insolent salespeople. God expects the salesperson to give their pitch and then God will destroy it and tell you everything else why that won't work. That's the Japanese system per se. Now, the problem with that is if you're pitching, you've got no idea how to pitch because you don't know what their interests are. And I was giving a speech last night at the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan, you know, very famous, established 1945, straight after the war, very prestigious club. And I was talking about this point. I had one of the members of the audience volunteer their favorite color and their least favorite color. Their least favorite color was green. Now, if I'm giving a pitch, I might start pitching green. And I might go on about green, 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 green. 
pointless because in this case his favorite color was purple he wants to hear about purple not about green but i don't know that and the only reason i don't know that is because i haven't had a chance to ask i've been told give me a pitch and why does god expect you to give a pitch because god in the japanese context of sales and buyer relationships is terrified of making a mistake is terrified of getting something wrong is terrified of this decision to buy from you creating trouble within the organization or coming back to haunt them later in their career so they found the best way to avoid any of that downside is to not buy and not entertain anything new and to stick with the devil they know you know we have that expression in english the devil you know is better than the angel you don't know zip mm. you and i are angels whenever we're in a new business situation and we're really going to help that company we're going to add value to those individuals but they're not going to lose us they're going to go with the devil who's not as good as we are but that's the devil they know so when i say it's the same the sales cycle is the same but you've got some major barriers and that's one of them about being able to ask questions and not give the pitch and then get killed so how hard is it to ask questions and get permission this is how hard it is we have a thing called a credibility statement a general statement about what you do dale county training is a hundred plus year old company who specializes in soft skills training general statement then you give a concrete example of where you've done something for someone else and been successful an example of this would be laurel piana where we train their entire staff in japan in sales and the president told me they got a 30 percent lift in their sales results as a result then you get into a question maybe we could do that for you not sure now we go into permission but in order for me to understand whether that's possible or not would you mind if i ask you a few questions that is how hard it is to get permission to ask questions but people don't do that japanese buyers certainly don't do that they just sit there and give their pitch and then get killed so if you understand this difference of japan everything else basically the same things work the problem though here is often people don't get off the first run they're stuck on the bottom rung of the ladder this is the issue it's uh, the same as everywhere else but there are some major things which are blockers and different mm, and you've taken your sales the dale carnegie um sales as an example as a representative of that philosophy or that system um dale carnegie is probably best known for uh, both his first book how to win friends and influence people and then for his sales techniques but i think many people don't actually know that these methodologies and teachings actually delve into everything that you've just spoken about here they're older than 100 years old and they include general communication leadership skills organizational management customer service presentation and more could you give us a rundown on the type of work that the institute and you personally are involved in the type of clientele you normally serve and how you help them thank you basically it varies slightly from year to year but it's about half half between our japanese domestic clients and our geishke foreign multinational clients this last year was 56% domestic 44% geishke and then the year before that was about 50-50 so it fluctuates around about the 50-50 so we're dealing with very old style very traditional japanese companies we're dealing with very new japanese companies we're dealing with the foreign multinational so we're across a broad range of, of clients and their needs and the things that they want will vary but we're probably doing uh, i think in the numbers i think we did last year about 60 percent of our delivery were for customized programs we have set courses uh, but we also have customized programs but 60 percent were customized for clients so one of the beauties of a company like ours is that because we've been going for such a long time we've got a very organized system and we've got major topics broken down into little micro segments little two-hour teaching blocks so we can quickly assemble in these very very like atoms or molecules into something very very fast for a client uh, taking these these micro segments and probably in japan the things we're asked for most would be leadership 
Uh, communication is another big one. Presentation skills is another big one. And, of course, sales training. And as I say, we have both set public courses, like these are on certain days, and then different companies would send their representatives to that training and make a mixed class. Or the customized training tends to be the in-house training where we'll either bring uh, an existing course to you in-house or we'll customize something and bring it in-house so it's only the people in that company. And therefore, we can go to another level of customization based around their reality. But uh, I'd say uh, what I've noticed in the last five years is that for our English programs, and we probably do 95% of our training in Japanese, by the way, but we do have English programs. For English programs, we're getting more and more Japanese executives coming into our English programs because they're working for geishke companies and they realize, well, that they've got to skill up, but they've also got to work on their English. So they do two birds with one stone type of approach where they're having to present in English and, and deal in small group interaction uh, discussions in English. Uh, they have to you know, read the manuals in English and then go through the instruction in English uh, to get that skill. But they also get the leadership. They also get the presentation skills. They also get the people skills. They get the communication skills at the same time. So that tends to, to be the things we're working on. And um, you know, we have, I think, some rather unique things in Dale Carnegie simply because we've been around for such a long time. You know, we're 107 years come January. Uh, next year. So we've been in Japan for 55, nearly 56. So that's a long period of time, especially in Japan, for localization. So when we get to companies, it's not that, oh, this is American, uh, take this. It's, yes, originally developed in America, but we've, over time, we've localized it for Japan. So it's best of both worlds. Global best practice, because we're in 100 countries around the world with offices. And then you've got, you know, local requirements. So we try and blend the two. And by Geishke, you mean foreign companies that have set up shop in Japan, yes? Yeah, I mean foreign multinational companies who are here. All the big names, you know, they're all here. If you're a, if you're a, a foreign company, your headquarters is outside of Japan. And, and often with those foreign um, Geishke, those multinational companies, the top leadership will be uh, from overseas. They'll be foreigners. But, you know, 90, 98% of the staff are Japanese. And so that's why we tend to do a lot of uh, our training in Japanese for the, the bulk of the team because their English isn't that good, so they need it in Japanese. And sometimes we do a mix. We do a hybrid. They, they, want it, they say, well, look, Greg, we want the training in English, but uh, many of our Japanese can't understand English very well, so it'd be great if we could actually have the training be bilingual and then we'll be able to flip into Japanese if needed during the training. So we do a hybrid as well. We do English, a hybrid, and then Japanese. And then these, for these companies that have um, foreign uh, division managers or, or CEOs or, or any, any executive level foreigners coming in and handling all of this Japanese staff, does part of the training then also include um, teaching them how to communicate with each other? Yeah, we have a program which is called Effective uh, Communications and Human Relations, also known as the Dale Carnegie course, the first course he developed. Uh, back in 1912, and it focuses on uh, building confidence to come out of your comfort zone, leadership skills of not the leadership skills of I'm the boss, do what I say. It could be peers. Uh, it's the leadership of uh, people that want to follow you. Uh, we have communication skills in that course. We have people skills in that course. And we also have stress management. So it's a bit of an omnibus course, but it's brilliant because often – it's hard to get people to switch up their game from what they've already been doing because they're sort of entrenched in that habit. You need a mindset shift and getting people to change, as you and I and everyone else on this, on this broadcast know, getting change in people is not easy. This is our go-to course for getting change. So where companies need to shift the mindset of their people, either following a new lead from headquarters on the direction of the company or – yeah, putting instituting a new culture within the company you need to get people behind that and this is the program we often go to for that because it switches up the mindset opens the mind up to accepting new things and you learn all these other skills uh, in human interaction as well because then you become very persuasive if you're trying to gather people to go with you you then have the persuasion skills to make that happen so we find that that uh, is something that's very much in demand and i think also in a much more 
high-tech world that we live in where we're communicating with machines, you know, Siri and Alexa. Uh, we're interfacing with people through texting, through social media updates. Uh, you can't ring anybody anymore, get them on the phone because we're always in a meeting. Uh, it's, it's interesting. The sort of human dimension of our communication is really diminished, I think, in, in so many ways. And people are not spending that much time talking with others like they used to. And in fact, there's been a series of uh, articles in the Japan Times, i see another one today, on uh, people living on their own more. People are not marrying. Uh, husbands are dying off and the wives are left with many, many years of 20 years of life left in them. And so, you know, people going through weeks at a time and not actually having a, any sort of deep conversation with anyone. And so, to some extent, our communication ability is going to become more important because uh, we're getting less skilled at it. So those who are capable and those who are uh, very, what, what can I say, very uh, effective in their communication with others will become the leaders. Uh, they will get picked up and they will then populate the leadership group in the future. So it's going to be a bit of divide here, I think, between the sort of passive followers and the communication skilled leaders you know i think people will start self-selecting or need to train themselves to be selected for leadership and that's quite interesting so we, we get a lot of engineers a lot of it engineers in our training for that particular course because the companies these days are requiring them to go with the uh, salespeople to visit the client and they get in front of the client they're terrible so we help them and you've mentioned um, a few times now um, the need to step out of the comfort zone, especially for Japanese um, employees, I would assume, um, the need to innovate a little bit more, to be a, bit, a little bit more proactive in your communication. Have you noticed, just because Japan is, is notoriously um, challenged in this department, have you noticed things changing since you've started operating with the Institute? Well, we see changes in our graduates. I mean, it's a, the particular program I just referred to then is a slow burn. That's a 12-week program. And so we want to get mindset change, get people to embrace change, to change themselves. You're not going to get that in one afternoon. You know, that's going to take a long time. So we have like one class a week, a week's break between each class so they can practice what they've learned during the classes, between the classes. And then about probably week four, week eight, and about week 10, we start to see big jumps in the change. But the biggest thing that people notice is how much their classmates are changing. And the changes are really, they're seeing them before their very eyes, and how people who are tremendously inarticulate or shy or bumbling and stumbling and umming and ahhing and just dreadful in communication are becoming very, very skilled. And so by the time they get to the graduation point, they've really, really turned that around. So it's quite dramatic. I mean, you know, we have in that confidence bill too, you know, we believe that inside each of us, there is a real strength, a number of strengths, but they're unknown to us. But they're there, but they've not been developed yet, and they're unknown to us. So in that particular class, we try and tap into and reveal and then amplify those hidden strengths that people have. And this is very dramatic for people. Now, you know, you can hardly believe it, but we often have cases where, where people are so emotionally charged from the changes they get from the training, how it really develops them from inside out. It's so powerful for them. They've really changed as a, as a person. They get to graduation and people are often crying. You know, they're, they're overcome with emotion because it's very powerful. When you tap into really deep-seated but hidden strengths, that energizes you, that motivates you, and suddenly you're doing things and challenging things and trying things and volunteering for things in your company and taking the lead on projects and stepping up in a way you would never have dreamed of before. So this is very, very powerful for people. So, you know, they see it in their family life, they see it in their company life, in their business life. So for some people, that's just, you know, it just wells up in them because it's such a dynamic change. So, yes, we see the changes, definitely, and... I mean, another thing just always I find incredible, you know, I've been in lots of training courses in my executive career. I've 
companies, certainly you know, Harvard Business School, Stanford Business School, INSEAD Business School, you know, uh, different universities in Australia, Macquarie University, you know, Sydney University, etc. But one thing I often hear from graduates of our program, and I'm talking about, I meet graduates from, you know, 40 years ago, you know, this type of thing, uh, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. The very common thing I hear is, this course changed my life. And I think about that and I go, wow, I've never heard of a course where people have said, this course changed my life, you know? So there's obviously something very deep in that program that's resonating with people that changes them and therefore they move forward in their business and their career. And then, you know, we have other programs like uh, High Impact Presentations, which is a two-day program, which get very dynamic. You know, you come in in the morning on day one, you go out the evening of day two, completely different in terms of your professional presentation skills. You go from someone who's struggling to string two words together and is incredibly nervous in front of a group to someone who's very articulate, very comfortable, very much in command, know what they're doing, got all the answers, you know, handle Q&A, just no problem. Dramatic change in two days, you know, dramatic change. That's a skill growth in two days. Dale Carnegie course is more on the character and personality side and it's a slower build, but we definitely see the changes. I suppose the fact that companies are now changing uh enough to send their staff to these sorts of uh, uh, training courses is, is probably uh, reflective, at least a little bit, of, of some changes that Japan corporate environment is going through as a rule. Have, have you noticed any other major changes um, society-wise or corporate-wise in the years that you've been training people here? Yeah, I think now we're starting to see a realization in Japan that on the job training, the famous OJT, it's pretty much run its course. In fact, it's probably run its course a long time ago, but people are still clinging to that. You know, the, when people say, well, who are your competitors? My answer is my first major competitor is apathy. This is where people and companies won't invest in themselves, develop their skill base, develop their professionalism. That's the first big competitor. The second big competitor is on-the-job training. Now, if we remember, late 80s, we had the bubble burst in Japan, right? Sort of go-go, late 80s, and then bubble burst. But I came here in 79, and I remember right through until that bubble bursting period, and prior to that, Japan was a bit of an outlier from an industrial and business structure. And there were many articles written on this, and, and journalists would cover this too, academics would cover it. They'd be looking at, wow, Japan's got so many layers, little layers inside their companies, incredible, compared to Western companies, which had much deeper layers. And what that meant, though, was as you moved up through the ranks, you were getting these little microscopic coaching sessions, you know, for each little jump you did from your boss, you know, and the boss didn't have such a big... Uh, remit to worry about they actually had the time to coach you but after the bubble burst the first things they cut they cut the training budget they cut the marketing budget and then they cut out all these layers to reduce the cost and so now you have bosses which much larger remits and, and more people to deal with less time for coaching they're busier and then about you know four or five years later in comes the keyboard you know bosses never touched the keyboard until then you know I mean, the internet email now bosses are doing their own email used to be the secretaries to do that. Well, now the boss is busy doing email, uh, trying to run the business, haven't got much time for coaching. So the on-the-job training part has really, really dissipated. And so typically in sales, what's the on-the-job training? You go and see three clients with your boss, that's it. You're on your own now, you know? So the whole coaching framework that traditionally did work, was very, very good, has basically collapsed. and. We're still, you know, here we are 30 years later, and some companies are still clean on the job training. However, the change I've noticed is that many aren't. Many have come to the uh, end of their tether. They've realized uh, we've, uh, you know, we're not getting anywhere here. Our skill sets are not good enough in our leadership. They're not good enough in our sales team. Uh, we've really got to make something happen here. And that's why they're bringing in people like us from outside. Uh, probably for the first time in a long time, to help them to skill up their people. And so I think that openness to um, 
outside training, external training is good. The other thing I've noticed too is that many companies are going overseas because they see the demographic downward trend in their consumer market here disappearing basically from what it used to be. Mm. So they know they've got to expand, so they go overseas. But it's not the overseas expansion that we remember, you know, back in the in the you know post war period where um, okay, Ziv, you know, you're transferred to you're transferred to uh, Portugal. Uh, you know, you're going to run Portugal for us. Off you go to Portugal for five years. You come back. You can go back to HR. Oh, Ziv, oh, you're back. Oh, 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 oh. Well, let's see if we can find a job for what you. What do we do with you now? <laughs> what do we do with you now, right? And then we've got to beat all that foreignization out of you and get you back to being a you know tribal Japanese <laughs> as well because now you've got ideas and you want to speak up. Now, what they're doing today, though, is the uh, Japanese person in the headquarters is running uh, through a matrix organization sections overseas. And what you've got now is a Japanese person in the headquarters is reporting to a foreigner who's located overseas, who's running a matrix global organization within the company. So that inside out type of thing has become uh, very, very interesting. So obviously English becomes much more important and your ability to communicate becomes much more important. And so for a number of companies now, we're doing a lot of our uh, internal training for them here in Japan in English. And it's not English language training. They do that. But this is what you do after that. So I find that change quite fascinating. Or they're sending the young people for extended periods overseas. Like in some cases, the sort of... uh, they look at the Rakuten example, Miki Tani san saying everyone's got to, you know, do English and get above a certain type of level or else. Uh, they say, well, I don't know, we can't do that. Our people are too hopeless. This English too hard. They're too old. You know, they're too stubborn. Blah blah blah. We give up on that. What we'll do though is we'll concentrate on the young people. So what they're doing is they're taking the young people and they're shipping them off overseas to their branches for a year or in some cases a couple of years, and they're they're getting them by by cultural and bilingual as the new hope for the company in the future. And they're doing it while they're young. So, you know, that's a pretty expensive proposition to do it that way, but some companies are saying this is the way forward. This is how we've got to do it. We've tried we've tried the other way. This wasn't working. Uh, for us, this is where we've got to go. So I think those that globalization impact is really hitting inside very tra- and I'm talking very traditional companies here. I'm not talking high tech, I'm not talking startups, I'm talking crusty you know, manufacturers and construction companies and this type of thing. So I think that is very interesting going forward. I think we'll see more and more of that, in fact. Okay, well, you've um, you've mentioned traditional uh, old school companies. Um, our main topic here usually is actually real estate. Have you um, have you seen much change? Or do, you, do you have any real estate uh, uh, clients, Japanese real estate companies, developers, anyone that's... Um, you know, well, I'm guessing hiring your services would mean that they are um, open to change. Do you see any of that? Yeah, we've uh, we've done we've done training for uh, not so much the Japanese real estate companies to date, but for some of the foreign multinationals. Uh, like, for example, CBRE is the largest, I think, still the largest uh, real estate company in the world. We trained, uh, I think it was 150, I think it was 150, 150 of their salespeople. It was a customized program. Again, the same thing. They got to a point where they'd be doing on-the-job training, just ran out of gas, and they weren't getting the results. So they um, created a customized program with us, and then we, over a long period of time, we delivered it uh, to the teams. And then, you know, what we found was that the... uh, the people who were the product of on-the-job training we were dealing with were very unskilled, very, very, very unskilled. And so when you look at them as salespeople, you wonder how on earth are they getting anything done here because they really don't know what they're doing and they don't have the, the professional capacity to be a you know, professional and successful salesperson. So that was a big eye-opener, a big eye-opener, frankly. Occasionally we'll get um, real estate people on our public programs and they may be, you know, sending themselves rather than their company sending them. But I'd say probably 90%, 95% of our uh, participants in our courses are sent by the company. Either directly the company tells you to go or they provide you with a training budget and then you can select where you'd like to go and they choose us. But I would say that uh, the sort of old school Japanese 
uh, real estate companies still don't get it. I don't think they're, they're still a bit behind in that regard. No, they're still working off brand. Oh, we're a big, powerful brand, so we don't have to be skillful. Uh, you know, we, uh, we've got um, lots of networks we can use, uh, so we'll use our network or, you know, we're connected to um, people's banks or, you know, from the funding point of view. Or, there's a whole bunch of things which are giving them an ability to still function in the market, but their competitors have the same things too. It's very... Uh, common case that they've got multiple competitors in the same business with all the same advantages. So how do you differentiate yourself from the salespeople from their rival company when they're doing the same thing? They're leading with the brand, you know, oh, we're, you know, we're this or we're that, and we're saying the same thing, and we've got this, and we've got, you know, they've got the same thing. This comes down to the individual salesperson's ability to convince the buyer that they should go with them. And, and, you know, as you and I know, in most countries around the world, we buy the salesperson and the company comes with it. But often in Japan, they buy the brand, they buy the company, and then the salesperson comes with that. It's sort of the other way around. Uh, so, you know, that's, again, the devil you know is superior to the angel you don't know type of problem, and they all go with the devil they know. So, yeah, that is still, I think, an area... Uh, an area we've still got, I think, a lot of opportunity. And they'll get there eventually because they're, you know, lots of companies are getting there. They're working it out. They just haven't gotten there yet. But I think, you know, in the um, certainly in the real estate business here, it's still, still, be it, you know, from the asset management point of view, the people working in that area, they're skilled in certain technical areas. But in a lot of those human dimensions, particularly around selling, not so skilled, leading, not so skilled, uh, still very old style, very old style. There's a, uh, you know, a, still a gap, big gap there that needs to be improved, I think. Mm. Mm. So I guess just to wrap up, how do you feel on everything that we've discussed here today, panning out, um, say, near to medium future? You've been here for a long time, so you've probably experienced some changes and you're seeing current trends. Are you optimistic about how Japan is or could be handling all of those changes? I think as far as real estate goes, if you're in the major cities, you know, like you are in Fukuoka, uh, then I think there's an opportunity in the real estate area for owning real estate. Uh, I think as far as non-major urban centers go, it's going to be very tough. Uh, I think the declining population is going to really impact on the market size and demand. So that's real estate, but it flow, flows across to just about every dimension where re reducing number of buyers is going to force change and force companies to become more competitive. It's also going to force them to globalize more. And when I got here in 1979, Everyone was talking about Coxacre, you know, Coxacre, Coxacre, internationalization. Mm. What are we talking about today, you know, 40 years later, Groburka, globalization. <laughs> so I say to myself, in 40 years, the only change they've made is from talking about internationalization to now using the term globalization, and they're still confronting the same phenomenon, the same problem. So I think, you know, that's going to create, that's going to create change. And I think also with the aging of the population, um, they're forcing they're forcing the seniors out. They're forcing them to retire, uh, and that's really around the money. They they because they're on an agent stage, escalator like progression. By the time they get to 60, 65, they're on pretty big money, and the companies don't want to keep paying them that. Um, so they force them to take you know half the salary, and they go on a year contract and this type of thing. But they don't have to find a way to keep those people involved because you know with the population decline we have and the types of foreigners they're planning to allow to come here and work, they're not at the level of company employees and the sort of professions at all. White-collar workers, they're not white-collar workers, so at this stage anyway, uh, mainly that's because of the language. So there's still going to be a big gap, I think, around need for people who are older to keep working. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that that will keep going. I'm optimistic that... Uh, if you're in certain areas in the real estate business, you'll be okay. Um, you know, I look at uh, I look at Tokyo. I think if you're in uh, Tokyo inside the Yamanote Sen, then that's a better place to be than on the other side of the line. Yamanote Sen's a circular mm. railway track that runs around Tokyo. It's quite a big 
big circle there, but this is where everything is in the centre, is it? The urban centre is there. And then outside that, you're getting the sort of uh, non-urban suburbs. Uh, I think centre will retain value. But if you're out in the suburbs, I don't see how you retain value. Uh, I think if you're looking at the succession planning for the company, I think that's going to be a bit of a challenge. Unless they start really working on the um, middle managers and younger generation to really train them up and, and reorient them around the professional skills they need to carry the company forward. If they can do that, then I think it'll be okay. If they still choose to keep going with on-the-job training, uh, I don't think it will be okay. I think someone else will be who's doing the training and making the investment will eat their lunch and they're going to dip out. So, you know, I'm, I'm always optimistic about Japan because, you know, I think now it's probably already the fourth, not third, probably fourth largest economy in the world. Probably India has already overtaken it. But still, you know, if you take, okay, America, China, India, Japan, right, well, who, who after India is coming? who would supplant Japan, hard to think of any country, and certainly no one in Europe, uh, who in Asia would supplant Japan and, and replace them as number four? Vietnam? No. Mm. Uh, Indonesia? No. Philippines? No. You go through the list of countries in Asia, and no one's got I mean, Japan, I think, permanently, will probably be sitting about number four. It's still number four, and it's number four with money. You know, it's number four with a very, very wealthy middle class and with great, uh, you know, demand around quality and certain requirements that are not easy to, to crack. But if you know how to crack it, then you've got a great market here. So I'm very upbeat about Japan. I mean, I've chosen now to live out my days here. So I've got a total commitment. You know, I've got a total commitment to the country. And, uh, of course, I, I want it to go forward. So I think for all of us in business... There are still many opportunities here. There are going to be lots of things that are going to happen here which will force change. And in that change, uh, I think a lot of us who are very nimble and uh, have seen the change elsewhere already will be well positioned, well placed to take advantage and be very effective in helping with that change through providing our solutions for companies and individuals as they struggle to make those changes. So I'm very upbeat. That's great. That's a, that's a very good note to uh, to finish on. Good stuff. Thanks for joining us today, Greg. It's been a pleasure yeah. speaking with you. Thank you for the opportunity, and I uh, really enjoyed this talk today. Thank you, and thank you as well, listeners, for tuning in. We hope you've enjoyed this content. Uh, we'll be linking to some of Dr. Story's content and to his LinkedIn profile in the show notes. Highly recommended for everyone to have a read or a listen. Greg's got three excellent podcasts that he regularly records, and they're all packed of very useful information for anyone in sales leadership or any type of management roles here in Japan or anywhere in the world, really. We do hope you'll share his content and ours with anyone who may find it interesting. Leave us a comment, ask us any questions you may have. It helps us better fine-tune the content that we provide to you than back. And if you've got another minute or two, we'd, as always, really appreciate it if you could rate us. Five stars for good, one star for bad, whichever whichever you uh, th seem to be thinking we are. On the iTunes store, if this is where you found us or anywhere else. And we hope to have you all with us next time. And until then, from all of us here at NTI, as well as from Dr. Story and the Dale Carnegie Institute, we wish you happy investing. Uh -huh.